job that's up to a great start there. I'm going to move straight away, because we've a lot to do tonight, to ask Lisa now to talk to us. Um, Lisa is the MP, the Labour MP for Wigan, but she's also the author, some of you might know, of um, a book called The Alternative Towards a New Progressive Alliance. So she too shares the views that come from us and that John has just spoken of, how we work together. Thank you, Lisa. And you know what? We've projected onto those people 
everything that we want it to be about over the last month. We told them this, this was about austerity and that this was about public services, that this was about immigration, that this was nothing to do with the EU, is what I've heard over and over again. Well, I'll just say this, it was about the EU, actually. It was about the context that I've just described. Insecure employment, boarded up the <coughs> streets, a sheer sense of hopelessness. But it was about much more than that as well. We, it was about what happens when you take that situation and throw free movement into the mix. And what you get, as I felt on doorsteps all over this country, is dynamite when that happens. And that's what people were trying to tell us. That, you know, to, to understand the sheer <coughs> anger of a young person who's just had their bur nursing bursary withdrawn by this government, who hasn't got the skills or the qualifications or the family connections or the money to be able to fulfil that dream of becoming a nurse. Bang! Up in smoke, in one committee meeting, because we abolished that bursary. And then for Labour politicians to be, to, be, to be on the airwaves, telling them that they should thank their lucky stars that they've got migrants who will staff the National Health Service. Do we really understand the level of anger amongst people in that situation? Because I don't think that we do. <coughs> and I want to say this. That there are a lot of people, a third of this country actually, who were passionately, passionately in favour of remaining in the European Union. Many of them are my friends, my neighbours, my family. Many of them at the moment are in utter despair. They feel like they are grieving for the country that they thought they lived in, a country that they want to get back. And I understand it, but I don't agree with it. Because if you look beyond the leave and the remain, uh, the divisions between leave and remain. There's something much stronger, I think, that I heard on both sides of this debate that unites people. Everywhere I went, people were talking to me about deep dissatisfaction with the labour market that gives the skilled and the mobile advantage and leave other people behind. There was strong support for investment in jobs and in skills and in public services, and there was a burning desire everywhere that I went for more power and more control over the things that matter, whether it's family or friends or neighbourhoods, the work that has dignity and meaning, and for a political system that doesn't just protect but actually celebrates family life as well. And these are, I was reflecting as I was listening to people on the other side of the debate for me, just as I did in the Scottish referendum, when I talked to socialists who were voting <coughs> for us, that these are Labour values, these are progressive values, these are values that unite people across the progressive parties in Britain. And people were expressing them on both the Leave and the Remain side. We feel deeply divided, but we aren't, in my view. 52% of this country weren't siding with Nigel Farage. In fact, my constituents who voted Leave, most of them, told me they were voting precisely against Nigel Farage's vision of a free market in labour and capital. 52% of this country aren't racist. They're not, they're against supranationalism, but they're not against internationalism. They're not against working together with others in similar predicaments across the European Union and the world. And in fact, if you go to Germany or France or Holland, you will hear the same debate about skills playing out against the background of free movement. You will hear this roar from people who have been left behind who want to be heard. And I think it gives us an opportunity. Because referendums are binary, they force people to take a side. They push us into a situation that tells us the world is black and white, when almost always, especially on this, the reality is shades of grey. And I believe that we can build a nation that speaks for both sides on this EU referendum that recognises that the EU has given us decades and decades of peace, that it's helped to drive up our living standards and our working conditions, and crucially, it's helped us to work together on shared challenges like climate change that have to be tackled now. But let's, let's understand too that it has cemented many of the problems in people's lives. It has been and operated at a level that is far too remote from people, and it is built on a system of free movement of labour and capital that is problematic, particularly for people 
who have already been left behind. These are international concerns. These are concerns felt across the European Union, and we can build a new nation on that. And I just echo something that John said. This is our agenda. This is a progressive agenda. Look at Theresa May's first speech for the many, not the few, about our industrial heartlands and the people who've been left behind. We cannot allow now us to step out of the picture and allow people like Liam Fox and David Davies and Andrea Ledson to go off and negotiate TTIP style trade deals behind closed doors that benefit capital over labour. The most the most powerful message of the EU referendum campaign was take back control. And I think now is the time that we say, actually, yeah, let's take back control. When I was the Shadow Energy Secretary until recently, I championed the many, many community schemes across the country where people are doing precisely that, where they're taking back control of their energy system, generating it, and powering us through the future. And what are they doing? They're, they're pulling back control locally in order to tackle international challenges in solidarity with people across the world. It's inspirational and it shows that from some of the poorest communities in this country to some of the wealthiest, this can absolutely be done. What do I think we need to do next? I think this means we have to take devolution really seriously. Not just the model of devolution we've been given so far, where people have been completely cut out of the conversation. Not just the evolution that takes power from one group of men in Whitehall and hands it to another group of men in the town hall, but real devolution that pushes power out downwards, doesn't suck it up to the regions. Real devolution that understands that without economic enfranchisement, there can be no democratic enfranchisement either. I think too often when we've dealt with major challenges in recent years, We've allowed people to be pitted against one another. Take climate change, one of my personal passions. We've allowed the interests of people who have lost jobs in the fossil fuel industries, who've, who've had to pay more through their energy bills in order to fund green energy policies. We've allowed their interests to be pitted against the people who are rightly saying we need to be more ambitious and we need to do more and we need to go further. Well, we can't allow it. I went to California last week where they've made, they've made their state the home of clean energy. They've, they've used the power of government in order to do it, but they've drawn on the power of community too. These are the sorts of things that we ought to be doing in this country. We can use the evolution as a way to lead the way on that. We're going to face so many more of these sorts of challenges over the next few years. Our job is to take both sides of this divided nation and bring them with us in a vision about the future. And I just wanted to finish by saying one thing about party politics in all of this. Because this isn't just about Labour, although obviously as a Labour MP I care passionately about whether my party gets this or understands this. But this is about people in the Liberal Democrats and the Green parties across all of the progressive parties and who belong or subscribe to no political party at all. We all share a commitment to social justice in this country, and if we don't work together, if we allow the Tories to divide us, then they will rule. And that is what they are absolutely determined to do. We can't unite the country if we don't collectively show that personal leadership ourselves and unite as well. And how we do that matters as much as what we do. Because I've seen for myself how inhumanity in personal relationships and debate in politics can then seep out of, out of the politics itself to policy decisions as well. And I'll just say if there's anybody in this room who belongs to a different progressive political party who is taking pleasure or sees opportunity in what is happening to my party at the moment, I would just say to you, don't. Because if the centre-left of British politics collapses, we know what the future will look like. And for working people across this country, we cannot afford to allow this to happen. We have a choice before us now. It's the choice before the country, and it's the choice before the Labour Party as well. Do we choose an angry, sour, hopeless politics that drives us apart, that's based on a misguided belief that our differences are irreconcilable and that none of us can speak for the majority in this country? Or do we square up to this challenge and set out now a positive, patriotic version of Britain 
that looks the future squarely in the eye and says, I call this an opportunity and not just a challenge. That's based on a radical redistribution of power in this country, local control combined with a ruthlessly international outlook based on solidarity. And I would say this, just to take you back to where we started about this EU referendum campaign, that this starts with respect. It starts with respect for people who don't agree with us. It starts with trust that people can make the right decisions about their own lives. And it starts, most of all, with a willingness to hear what George Eliot called that roar that lies on the other side of silence. In reality, this is the only choice before us. The future has to look like this, and we've got to build it. Thank you.